presentation. Uh, <laughs> I, I want to thank you for giving me this time to speak this morning. This is something I really wanted to do. You heard Bob say that Joe begged him to speak this morning. I kind of elbowed my way into this. <laughs> and Bob was nice enough to say he'd give me some of his time, and he's taking it away. <laughs> Opportunities like this allow us to get to know each other better, and, mm -hmm. and that's really important to me. I've had the chance to get to know some of you on my trips down here for board meetings and to visit Valerie and Dustin. I've gotten to know Talon and Jacob and Josiah and Nathan and Brooke and some others of you, and it's good to get to know you. Um, and so it's relevant to this presentation I have to tell you a little about myself. I really don't want to talk about myself, but it's important that you know how my path intersected with them. Church of God. So when I was 10 years old, my family was looking for a church. We had actually, when I was an infant and a toddler, uh, we had went to church. And I, had, I had grown up in the church, but that church had a fire and it got disbanded and we went a number of years with no church. So I was about 10 and my brother, my family consisted of my mom, my dad, my brother and I. My brother's a couple of years older than me. And it was important to my parents that we went to church, that we had that teaching we had a home church and that we grew up in the faith. So we started visiting churches and we'd go a few Sundays, this was over a period of a couple of years, we'd go a few Sundays and we weren't really connecting with any of the churches we were visiting. And so during the course of this time, somebody hung a Bible track on our front door. And you know, timing is everything. And uh, this was a Bible track from a church that was actually a neighborhood church that was only a few blocks away. And it was Hope Chapel Church of God. The Abrahamic faith. And so we went there as we had been going to churches and uh, we liked it. The people were friendly. We managed to connect and we kept going. Uh, I was 12 years old when we started. It's been almost 52 years now. That was the church I grew up in and it, that was the church to that family. As Valerie said, it also became the church to subsequent my family. And uh, had the opportunity there to meet lots of, uh, and work with lots of wonderful pastors and teachers and church members who shaped and molded my life and, it, and you know, it became really the strength of my life. So when things weren't good, I always had that. Um, and so it's, it's been a great blessing. And I, you know, I grew up in that church. And my mom and my dad, my brother and I were all baptized together in 1966, two years after we started going there. And uh, I'll never forget that. So it was a memorable event. It was an evening service, as I recollect. It was the sole purpose of was to baptize our family, the four of us. And I remember how happy the church was. I remember all the smiling faces. And uh, it was just a really uh, good feeling, and it was a, a wonderful event. So as time went on, uh, at the age of 29, I was elected to be an elder in that church. And... Uh, that was really great. And I'll never forget, there was a woman in the church who was a, a real pillar of the church, a real foundational member of the church. And she said, public put it in a, even put it in a letter to the proper people, Dennis is too young to be an elder. He doesn't have any white hair. And uh, that's the kind of critique you don't easily forget. But you know, she was a wonderful woman. And, uh, I love her to this day. Uh, and she was uh, a Sunday school teacher, she was a Sunday school superintendent. She had a, a, an accomplished life outside the church. Twice her life was written up in the local newspaper with pictures. And I don't have time to go into it, but uh, needless to say, she was, she was what I call, and I mean this in a positive way, she was stubborn, opinionated. She thought about her, what she wanted to do <coughs> carefully to achieve her goals. And she's what I call, and again, I mean this in a positive way, she's what I call typical Church of God. People are attracted, some people are attracted to this faith because they have those traits. And to be passionate about a faith that's a minority view among uh, most of the religious world that believes differently, you need to be a truth seeker. You, you need to be opinionated, you need to be stubborn, but all those things can be good in that sense. And so, 
I appreciate her greatly. She lived to be 108 years old. Oh my goodness. And uh, she, she's been dead for at least 30 years. And so I think she knew something about age and experience. And I must admit, I find as I get older, I'm seeing her point of view. <laughs> so it's, uh, it's nice that uh, all these years after her death and after her long life, life I'm still talking about her. That, that's a life worth having. And by the way, I wanted to say about that Bible track, just back up for a second, that was hung on my front door that caused us, my family to go to this church. I later read, of all the methods to do evangelism, from the most effective to the least effective, the absolute least effective way to do evangelism is to hang a track on somebody's door and leave. Mm -hmm. <laughs> but it's not zero effective because I'm here today. So fast forward to General Conference last summer where I had the good fortune to be elected to the Board of Directors, which I'm very thankful for. And if you were there and you voted for me, thank you, because you had to vote six times to get me elected. <laughs> So I appreciate that. So we had our first board meeting last <laughs> October. And in that board meeting, I think it was Scott Millard said, you know, Dennis is the oldest member of the board of directors. <laughs> Thanks for pointing that out. <laughs> <laughs> but, and, and it's true, but I tell you, I didn't win that race by a lot, okay? <laughs> just want to establish that. But it's, you know, it's not about young, it's not about old, it's not really about anything in between. That's the truth, it's really not. It's about opening up your life and letting God work in your life. And letting him work through the power of his spirit. And it doesn't matter what your age is. He's, he can find plenty for you to do and for you to accomplish. So, you know, I wish I could tell you that I'm an academic. I'm, I'm not. I wish I could tell you I'm some type of Bible scholar. I'm not. I didn't go to Atlanta Bible College. I didn't even go to Oregon Bible College, which is what it would have been at, at the time. Um, I've spent the last 30 plus years in the business environment of operations management. We're not going to go into that because we don't have time. But, but here's what I am in regards to my spiritual life, and this is very important. Um, in regards to my spiritual life, I'm the product. I am the product of pastors and church leaders and people who went to Atlanta Bible College. I'm here because of them, and I have benefited because of them. And I'm tremendously grateful for that. And I'm the, I'm the product of people who were taught by people who went to the college and then taught others. So indirectly and both directly, uh, I'm the product of this college. And I think that's important. That's the growing influence we want this college to have. And that's why uh, we want all of you to have that type of influence. And there's a lot of people like me, but obviously I can talk about myself. The purpose of this presentation, like I said, is to promote Atlanta Bible College, a general conference in Abraham. <coughs> It's to promote you. And the board of directors, if it's a group, recognizes we need, that we can do a better job of promoting it and selling it and marketing it. And we need to do that. We do a good job of it, I think, in the Restitution Herald. But I like to see us do it out in our churches, at our conferences, at our seminars, um, because we have to grow. We don't want to shrink and die. And, and we've had some of that. So this is my attempt to do that. And uh, it's, it's just a start. It needs to be built upon. And I, I know others can do better, but I'm retired and I have time. So I know. <laughs> so here we go. <coughs> Quickly starts with a mission statement to, to serve churches and individuals in the ministry of the gospel of Jesus Christ and God's kingdom. Or very simply, uh, to serve and equip ministries for the kingdom of God. That's easy to remember. Uh, so that's our mission statement. That's what we would say in the business world. That's our value add. That's who we are, that's why we're here, and that's very specific. So I want to look, as we go through this, I want to look at why, where, what, and who. And we'll probably spend the most time on the why, we'll go through the where and why quickly, because you, you, you're here, you know that. Again, this is not so much targeted for you, it's targeted for people not familiar, people out in the churches and so forth. So I want to... The mission statement is why in a specific sense. I want to look at why in a, in a broader sense. And that's because I believe there's an urgency like never before. You know, the world has changed a lot just during my lifetime, okay? <coughs> I'm giving you enough years now you can figure out I'm 64 years old. And the world has changed a lot during my lifetime. You know, when I was young, or even a young adult, 
and something <coughs> happened on the other side of the world, it was just something that happened on the other side of the world. It didn't change the course of my day. It was, it was just information. Um, but the big thing that's different today, in my estimation, is we, we live in a global society. We really do. We, we live in an international community that's very tightly connected with instantaneous information. It wasn't like that when I was growing up, and even as a young adult. So, you know, while things were just information to me, if there was a, a, some type of disaster on the other side of the world, well, that was a disaster that happened on the other side of the world. If there was a war that eliminated a country or split a country into two countries, changed the political landscape, well, that was just something that happened. It didn't change the course of my day. Mm -hmm. But today, something can happen in China or <coughs> India or Taiwan or Japan, you lose your job. Mm -hmm. And fairly quickly. Mm -hmm. uh, and that's happened. Remember, that happened to me. <laughs> um, so that's the beginning of why it's important that we are that you are where you're at, uh, and I believe you're in the right place at the right time, and that's why I wanted to join you. When I got the opportunity to retire a little early last year, I did it because I knew what I wanted to do, and I'm thankful I got the opportunity. You know, I've always been heavily involved with my home church, with Timberland, but uh, and this gives me. Retiring gives me more quality time because you know you know how it is when you're working 50 hours a week or more and you've got a family you've got all these demands you're doing your church work on the fly you're doing it at the last minute and so now I can do it with in a much more quality fashion with more time and enjoy it better um, but in addition to that I wanted to be part of the of the college and the conference so in pursuing the why I, I pulled out four articles here that caught my attention. And we're going to go through them quickly. But the first two are not a big deal. The second two are more serious. But when I see these things in the paper, I'm always looking at it with an eye for, you know, from my worldview, from my point of view, from where the world's at, like we were just talking about. And, and here's an article that I saw last summer. I was visiting, my wife and I were visiting my cousin who lives in Lexington, Kentucky. This is in the Lexington Herald Leader. And it's a, it's a study that, was, that took place. And it's a study of social activities finds religion helps sustain happiness. Now, I'm sure you've seen these type of studies. This is not uncommon. But there's something that caught my interest about this one that we'll get to in a minute. But what I found was that the secret to sustain happiness lies in participation in religion. And this study looked at four areas, four areas that people normally turn to to find happiness in their life when they're not finding it. When their job's not fulfilling them enough, maybe their family life isn't either. These are four areas people normally turn to, and this is what they study. First was volunteering or working for a charity. That's common. Second was taking educational courses to pursue some interests they may already have. The third, participating in religious organizations. And the fourth, participating in a political or community organization. And of the four, religious organization was the only social activity so associated with sustained happiness. The only one. Hmm. Now, the reason I found this particular study interesting, it was done in the Netherlands. You know in the Netherlands, if you ask people if they believe in God, only 17%, one seven, only 17% will say they believe in God. Whatever that means. <laughs> okay. In the Netherlands, a significantly larger number, 25%, are happy to say they're atheists. And 60% are on the fence. So, you know, maybe there's a good mission field there. So I thought this was a relevant article. The second article, which is again, is kind of on the lighter side, but it caught my attention. This is from the Harbor Country News, which is a little newspaper that circulates among, among a bunch of beach towns on Michigan's west coast, on Lake Michigan, because we have a little weekend cottage there, and we get this newspaper. And I saw this article, which was about a brew pub pizzeria was going in the former Methodist church, okay? And the article notes that this brewery and pizzeria is now receiving well wishes from its main critics, meaning they fought it, they did everything they could, they lost, and now they're being good sports and wishing them well. And this, this was a church that, and a congregation that existed since the Civil War. And now it's going to be a brewery and a pizza restaurant. 
and they look forward to it becoming a landmark destination. Wouldn't it be nice if our churches were a landmark destination? <laughs> Wouldn't that be nice? Um, this is what we don't want our churches to become, and this is why you're in the right place at the right time and doing the right things. And that was the point of that article. This gets a little more serious. This, this was an article, and there were a number of articles about this at the time. This is from my hometown newspaper, the South Bend Tribune, last October. And you know, when I was growing up in the church, whenever we talked about prophecy, and in, in all honesty, in our particular church, we didn't talk about it that much, but when we did, it would often come up about the temple being rebuilt on this site of the Temple Mount, a site that I'm sure you know is sacred to three religions, Judaism, <coughs> Islam, and Christianity. And it's the site where the first, the area where the first two temples were built. And the prophecy, of course, is before Jesus returns, many believe the third temple will have to be rebuilt there. It's also, though, the site of the Dome of the Rock, which is the, the third holiest site in Islam, and the structure that enshrines the rock from which Muhammad is said to have ascended to heaven. It's the, it's the site where uh, Abraham offered Isaac, found him and offered him as a sacrifice, was willing to offer him as a sacrifice. Some believe it's where God gathered the dust of the earth and formed man. But the gist of the article is that it's become so contentious that they've had to install electronic monitoring beyond their toes that the, because the, and they've made the country of Jordan the custodian of this site because they can't let the Israelis, they can't let the Palestinians because they can't work together. So Jordan is, is the custodian. But, but the whole point of the article is they had to install this electronic monitoring. This is just stuff we used to talk about. Nothing was happening, okay? It's happening. You know, we're, we're supposed to be watching and ready and aware. This is part of watching and being ready and aware. It's motivating to me. It's, it's happening. You know? We're either living in the last days or we're awful close to it because you see a lot of this type of thing. Last one, which I found really interesting. Only one sentence is all you need to know from this article. This is an op-ed piece, again, from the South and the Tribune, from, you may have heard of Charles Krauthammer. And the first sentence in his, what he writes, he says, Christianity, whose presence in the Middle East predates Islam by 600 years, is about to be cleansed from the Middle East. Now, if that doesn't get your attention, here's the birthplace of Christianity, where Jesus was born and walked and taught by his disciples. Christianity is about to be cleansed from the whole area. It says the consequences for Christians are terrible. Enslavement, exile, torture, massacre, crucifixion. Over the decades, many Middle Eastern Christians, seeing the rise of political Islam and the intensification of savage sectarian wars, have simply left. Well, who would? You see it on TV, you see the beheadings. You see them put in a cage and burned alive and all these terrible things. Of course they're leaving. Leaving to the point where Christianity is very close to being completely cleansed from the Middle East. Again, we're, we're waiting and watching, right? Mm -hmm. uh, and we see these things. I had, uh, in preparation for this presentation, which actually I, the thought process and the planning started uh, last year, I wrote to Jan Stilson and I said, you know, could you give me uh, a bullet point list, any chance you would have a bullet point list of the foundational beliefs of the Church of God of the Abrahamic faith from its origin? Uh, and if you have some pictures, that would be nice too. And she was real nice and she sent me, and this is her writing at the top here in italics. Um, she says, here's a suggested bullet list of unique doctrines that have been the foundation of the Churches of God ministry since the days of Joseph Marsh from 1845 to the present. That's what she wrote to me, and she sent me this bullet point list, which is not hugely different from the statement of faith that's on the conference website. But I like this one because it, it goes back to the beginning. It's almost, almost 200 years ago. And we don't have time to go through these one by one. But what's, it's important to note here but I believe we need to lead with these things. These beliefs are why we exist. And we need to be talking about the oneness of God. Deuteronomy 6, 4, the Shema, Hero of Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. Not, not a complex unity, not three in one. He's just one. 
we need, we, we need to not be ashamed of this. And we need, to, we need to be the voice of this. Because if not us, who? who? Jesus, you know, the only begotten Son of God, for God so loved the world, He gave His only begotten Son, meaning brought to existence, His origin, His beginning. The Holy Spirit is the power of God. The Bible is the inspired Word of God. All Scripture is inspired by God and profitable for teaching, for reproof, for correction, for training in righteousness. There's life only in Christ, and we will receive our reward when He returns. The second coming is hugely important. Resurrection is central to what we believe. Man is mortal and sleeps in death. That may be the hardest one for a lot of people. That may be the hardest one. I, I think it is. That's just so hard to believe. You, you hear it all the time. You heard it this week. Nancy's in heaven with Ronnie. And I, I love the Reagans. Wonderful people. He's, what a personality that guy had. Storyteller. Engaging. But like everybody else, you get, <laughs> get the same narrative, right? Um, okay, continuing. Oh, my friend's getting too little. I have the glasses on. <laughs> Jesus will establish his peaceful millennial kingdom on earth, and we shall be rulers with him. 1 Corinthians 6 2. Do you not know that saints will judge, rule, and minister the world? I'm sure you know those things. But everybody doesn't know them. A lot of people don't know them. And we have, we have to talk about them. Satan will be bound during the millennium. Jehovah God will host a great white throne judgment. I wonder how many people in our churches, in the pew, even know what a great white throne judgment is. When Christ has completed his work of restitution of all things, including new heavens and new earth, Jehovah God will descend <coughs> with new heavens and new earth. Christ will turn over the keys of the kingdom of the Father. God will be all in all, and Jesus will be subject to him. 1 Corinthians 15, 27, 28 and the eternal age will begin. Luke, said, Luke talks about the certainty of the things you've been taught, the exact truth. Yes. Uh, there's a reason why the word truth is 118 times in the New Testament. There's a reason why 22 times Jesus says, I tell you the truth. I tell you the truth. Because somebody was, he was working against somebody that was forces that were telling something that wasn't the truth. Mm -hmm. yeah. It's only common sense. That's why he has to say, I tell you the truth. It's a beautiful thing, the church of God and how it was founded. Its origin, its beginning. You know, we don't trace our, our beginning back to the Reformation. We're not a Reformation church. We don't tra we're not a founded church. We don't trace our origin back to any one charismatic leader who had this massive influence over the numbers. We don't do that. We're not a splinter church. We didn't break off from another denomination or another church. We were beautifully founded by people in North America and England doing their own Bible study. Open-minded people with just their Bibles seeking the truth and finding it and finding each other through writing papers. And then it transitioned to circuit writing pastors who started churches, who started state conferences, who started a general conference. And that's, you know, that's our story. And it's a beautiful story. So in light of all that, like I said, I spent most of the time on the why. Don't worry, we're not going to be we're not going to be here for an hour and a half. Here's a little, my own little purpose statement. And if there's only two things you remember from this presentation, this is one of the two. We'll get to the second one later. If we're not actively teaching the gospel that Jesus taught, then we're actively teaching another gospel. Amen. Mm -hmm. um, I think that's worth remembering. You know, scholarship is important, academics matter. And, if I may quote Anthony Bozer, we cannot be Billy Graham light because we'll fail and disappear. They're bigger, they're better financed, they're stronger. We will be the gnat on the horse's hind end. We won't matter. And it's not, it's not who we are. You've seen who we are. You've seen how we were found. You see our statement of beliefs. So scholarship's important. If we're not actively teaching the gospel that Jesus taught, then we're actively teaching another gospel. Okay, we're going to go quickly now because, again, this is intended for people that are not here, out in the churches, that may be at the conferences, seminars, where we want them to understand who we are, what we have, and what we do, and why we do it. <coughs> I like contrast, so this, Jan sent me this picture. So you contrast today's wonderful, beautiful building 
with, this is like 1941, and a building that we worked out of, I wasn't there. <laughs> <laughs> talk about student housing, which we're transitioning to the lots we bought, it's an opportunity to talk about that. Uh, first home under construction, you see some pictures of that. Floor plans, the home we had the opportunity to buy right across the street, which Dustin and Valerie took me to last night. We walked through it and saw it, saw Nathan and uh, Callan and not down, Nathan and uh, Jacob and uh, Josiah. Okay. Another contrast. The house today on the right, house in 1941 on the left. So it's nice to see where we were and where we've come from and how we've been blessed. The who, that's you, a number of pictures. I think the visual is important. People need to see the classroom, the students, the instructors. It can't just be conceptual, vaguely conceptual, let's, let's have the visual. And so there we have it. A lot of these are classroom pictures or combinations of students and instructors. Oops. Uh, see more of that here. Picture on the right is nice because you have the students, you have the instructor, and you see what they're talking about. It's the introduction to the book of Acts. So we're early doing the Bible, right? Just pretending. Uh, Dr. Joe and some students, there he is again. And then I have a couple of pages here just to show the positions that we staff, what's required to have this operation, and the people that fill them. Because those positions are important, those people are important. This, I like, it's from Jan Silson. This is students at OBC in 1941. And look at that, look, they're all smiling, they're all happy. They're happy to be where they're at. We should be all the more happy because we know so much more like we were referring to earlier. We know the times we're living in and how important it is. But the women are wearing dresses, the men are wearing suits, they all have smiles on their faces. <coughs> Again, I like contrast. So contrast this with picture day. <laughs> but everybody's still smiling, right? Everybody's still smiling. Jacob's a throwback to the past. He's got the shirt and tie. But he doesn't have to, right? So that's right. Overachiever. <laughs> okay, I said there were two things I would really like you to remember from this presentation. You don't remember anything else. One, one, first one is if we're not actively teaching the gospel that Jesus taught, then we're actively teaching another gospel. This second purpose statement, again, these are modeled after mission statements, value statements, trying to create a corporate culture in the business environment. I've stolen from that, applied it to here. This organization's greatest asset is our people, and the product we offer is our message. So you see that the people are the students, the teachers, the staff, the donors, the board of directors. The product is really those two slides earlier with the statement of faith from almost 200 years ago that's still the same today. But in a nutshell, our message is the good news of the kingdom of God in the name of Jesus Christ, Acts 8 12. That's it in a nutshell. You know, those things that are really important can almost always be stated very simply. Yeah. And that's what this is. I want to, I have a couple of slides on the Korean extension because I think that's important work. We went up there last October, first time I've ever seen it. I was really impressed with the facilities, with, with the people, with Steve and Sam, <coughs> the work they're doing there. And uh, I hope and pray we can continue to support that effort. Uh, it, it's mm. certainly worthy. We're going to skip that in the interest of time. This um, <coughs> slide here, I want people to see what it costs to run this operation because we can't do it without finances, like everything else in the world. And this is from General Conference. This was the expensive budget adopted last summer at General Conference at South Bend. And $885,000 it takes to keep this operation going. And you see half of that is staff, wages, and salaries. And that might look big to you. You know why that looks big? Because we've cut everything to bare bones. And if you cut all the people away, you don't have anything left. So I think that's why that part of it looks big. But you can see pieces of the pie there. And the 885000 it takes, that's why you need to make the most of the opportunity you have here. Because Amen. people are giving their good money and wanting the best. And, and you will be the best. This is not income, this is giving. 
505,000, you see over a third of that comes from individuals, over a third of that comes from churches. So where's the $380,000, right? It's got, a, well, the difference, that $380,000 that's missing to cover those expenses comes from two places. About half of it comes from tuition, and the other half comes from tenant income. And uh, it's great that we have this situation where we have a building and we can lease out space and we can make income to support the ministry. It's, that's a great blessing. We're thankful for it. But wouldn't it be nice if we needed the whole building? And we have to think like that. Wouldn't it be nice if we needed the whole building to train and educate students and have our influence and impact on the world? Last slide. You have to close the sale, right? The presentation is meant to have an impact, hopefully. So this is the crux, the heart of the matter. Close the sale. Here's what we need, people. We need students, and we need financial support. And of course, we need people to pray. Pray for the college and conference as we strive to succeed at fulfilling our mission statement. But we want people to understand the work we do, why we do it, where we do it, how we do it. And let, you know, let me just say, a lot is said in the teachings in the New Testament about unity. We have to be united in what we do. Division is an enemy. We can't be divided. We have enough opposition. We don't need ourselves. So let's be united and let's promote the College of Conference. Amen. Amen. That was fantastic, Dennis. Thank you. I got the cue from uh, Netanyahu that we'll pray him. Is that the cue? <laughs> Let's pray. Father God, we thank you for this day. I thank you for both Bob's presentation and Dennis's presentation. Lord, help us to be about your business. Help us to be a part of Matthew 24, 14. The gospel of the kingdom being preached to the ends of the earth. Lord, bless our missions in Africa. Bless our mission here. Just draw us close. Father, we thank you for this day. I ask your blessing on the food we're about to partake. Bless it to our use, but to your glory. In Jesus' name, amen. Thank you, Thank you all very much. Thank you, Maddie, for coming. Look, you even brought somebody else in. Annette. You know, I thought I kicked it out of the car and lost it. Okay, the pillow. I was very really thrilled because it was like turning water bottle. I thought I just got out of the car. How are you doing? He's doing great. Yeah.